Uh, okay, well, so thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've learned a lot of different things on infrastructure, implementation, software, uh, policy, platforms. Uh, I, I want to shift, shift gears a bit and actually go into content, like old style uh, evaluation of content, because I think we're all for innovations in publication and peer review. Uh, we should also be wary of like, testing them and see what actually comes out of that. So uh, I'll present a piece of research on uh, quality reporting in preprints and peer-reviewed articles. Uh, my conflict of interest here, I'm an, amb I'm an ambassador for ASAP Bio, which makes me a big supporter of preprints. That may bias me a little bit in terms of interpreting the results. That said, the funding is all uh, from pu public agencies in Brazil. So we really have peer review as a very well-established dogma in, in, in science. I mean, most scientists will consider that pre-publication peer review is important, that improves articles, that it provides some kind of filter, and that would have a mess without it. Uh, that said, uh, there's a little bit of irony in this image in the upper left. I mean, uh, this is from the March of Science in Washington. It says, in peer review we trust. But actually, you take away God, you put in peer review. and. That has not really been very much empirically tested, perhaps a little bit more than God, but not that much. I mean, we have not done a lot of research on whether peer review actually improves science systemically. I mean, uh, and, and concerning the three claims below, which is, again, an opinion of, of the majority of science, I'll say the filter one is clearly wrong. I don't think peer review can really filter out bad research systemically. But even the first one, which seems simple, like does peer review improve the quality of published papers, is actually has not been that well studied. I mean, there are some little studies, but this is a Cochrane uh, collaboration review from 2007. And actually, their conclusion in 2007 was there's actually little empirical evidence to support the use of editorial peer review. We have some small studies, mostly in individual journals, showing that, yes, there are some small improvements in manuscripts after peer review. Uh, of course, those are the ones that get accepted. You could say that rejection also helps in that sense. But like, they're usually small. So you have the bars here, and you have the, 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 the stars here. And really, I mean, uh, the improvements are, are usually minor. Uh, you should weigh that with the fact that we also have small studies from uh, journals showing that there's actually very little agreement between reviewers. For some neuroscience uh, journals, this is pretty much almost a chance level. This is from the NIH uh, this year, and actually their reviewer agreement between grant reviewers is actually exactly zero here, which is quite, kind of scary. Uh, but that said, we don't have a lot of research, and we usually have small studies because peer review has mostly happened clo behind closed doors for most of the history of science. That said, uh, it, it, it has changed in other fields, and it's, it, it's changing fast in biology. I mean, preprints are really gaining traction in biology over the last two years. Started out with small events, uh, the first days at bio meetings, some researchers putting research online, uh, the, the Zika epidemic, which also led some journals to get in, and suddenly this kind of exploded uh, from 2016 onwards. Uh, so. That said, it's still uh, a minority practice or a niche practice uh, in biology. I mean, as much as explosive as the growth has been, uh, this corresponds to like maybe less than 2% of life sciences articles actually coming out first in a preprint. And still a lot of scientists have concerns over uh, the system, that we are letting too much low quality research uh, get published, that preprints might be of lower quality than average articles, concerns about scooping, and, I mean. Uh, so uh, it's, it's something that we should study. And the good thing here is actually, actually preprints allow us an opportunity to actually study what happens to manuscripts with, with peer review because we actually have access to what is supposed to be the first version of the manuscript and the reviewed version. And I don't think this has been actually used a lot. I know of this study that compared the uh, preprints in archive and bioarchive with their final postprint versions. And uh, uh, they, they basically use word metrics. Their conclusion, most articles don't change that much. It's like less than 20%. But that's just metrics. That's just words. I mean, uh, can you actually assess quality? And of course, that's hard, because measuring scientific quality is a very, very vague question. Uh, and of course, that goes uh, in different ways in different areas. Uh, it is very subjective, and it should be probably. But there may be some objective quality uh, measures that you can get. So like scientific quality as a whole is hard to pin down. But there are consensus things on, on for example, what it should report in terms of methods and results. I mean, it's clearly better to report whether your bar graph has a mean or a median, whether the error bars are standard errors or standard variance. The right practice is reported. So I mean, that's more of a yes or no question. And that you can break down into a square questionnaire or checklist that actually might be more uh, 
available to, to objective evaluation. Uh, not, not accidentally reporting quality has been the focus of many initiatives in terms of improving journals, uh, the Equator Network uh, reporting checklist by journals. And we actually stole our methodology from two studies by the Camarades Group in Scotland who really used uh, something like we did, a crowdsource approach, to evaluate uh, quality reporting to develop two checklists uh, implemented by Nature and by PLOS One, the effects of that on the quality of reporting of manuscripts. Uh, so our goal here is actually to use the same approach to study the preprint system. We actually have two main goals. One is to actually compare reporting quality between, between a random sample, so your average article in BioArchive and in PubMed, uh, just to see if the quality more or less compares. And the second one is actually to compare preprints with their published versions to actually look more specifically into the effect of peer review on those manuscripts. Uh, we actually only got far past the, the first stage. We're just start, starting the second one, actually. Even for the first stage, I had the results in last Friday, so I've been analyzing them on the fly. This is like a road premiere uh, of, what I'm, of what I'm about to show. But what we did, basically, we took random samples of 2016 articles from PubMed and from BioArchive, the first versions of the preprints, and we included articles that were in English, included original results on cells, microorganisms, or animals, including humans, and presented at least one statistical comparison between groups, because a lot of the reporting stuff is about statistics and test results. Uh, most of the questions concern the first figure, subfigure, or table containing a comparison. So, I mean, it's kind of hard to get a 30 figure paper and try to see if everything is, but like getting a single figure seems like a reasonable way to sample this, uh, and, 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 and it's probably valid. And we paired them by type of biological model because the questionnaire is not exactly the same, so we had to have the same uh, number of in vitro, invertebrate, vertebrate, and human articles on both sides. And this is our measurement too. So we built up a, a reporting quality questionnaire that tried to be as, uh, as, a, a, as widely applicable as possible. We built it uh, on the basis of existing checklists and existing reporting guidelines. And it has some very objective questions like, is the biological model and species presented in the abstract? Uh, do the author report funding sources? Uh, are, the outcome measure, uh, are, are the outcome measures done by blinded? So, I mean, everyone is kind of a yes or no or non-applicable question, but they're quite objective. So, like, are the antibodies, do they, I mean, do you have a validation profile or, 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 or the company name? For data presentation, uh, is the summer estimate a mean or a median? Is, are the error bars standard deviations or standard errors? I mean, you don't have, there's no right answer. It's just like, do you report this, right? Data analysis. Is the sample size reported for each group? Uh, is the statistical test clear? Uh, do we have an exact p-value, et cetera, et cetera? Then we have uh, some specific questions for types of articles. So in vitro studies, like what are your cultural conditions? Are the cells authenticated? For animal studies, it's sex, uh, age, housing. For vertebrates, you have extra ethical questions that you go through an ethics committee. And for human studies, because you have inclusion criteria, randomization, uh, blinding, uh, et cetera. And uh, interesting thing here, and this is the engaging part, we crowdsourced uh, the whole thing. So we, through the ASO, through our own personal networks and through the ASAP Bio blog and Twitter, uh, we looked for evaluators who wanted to board uh, this project. And this is actually a very nice way to do meta research. It diminishes the, load, the workload for everybody. And it's actually engaging in terms of like everybody who's participating is thinking about preprints, thinking about uh, quality reporting. They spread the word as well. So I think it's, it's a nice way to do the simple projects. So we had 15 people in four countries. Uh, to get in, they had to score at least 75% agreement with a group of consensus, with, with our consensus, like the coordinating team's consensus answer on a group of articles, which we all did together and got to like agreement. So uh, those 15 was actually those who passed the test. I think we had like 20 something people interested in. And uh, each article was actually triple scored to reduce bias. And we took the most prevalent answer as the right one. So if everybody agrees, of course, that's the right answer. If two people say one thing and one says another, we take the two people uh, answer. If nobody agrees with anything, we go in and we actually reach our, our own consensus answer. Uh, but actually, agreement was quite good. So if you look at the right, this is the agreement of each one of the 15 evaluators with the rest of the sample. And it's around 80%, like from 77 to 86, I think, which 84, sorry, uh, which is actually quite striking. But nobody's really falling off the board. So uh, it appears that we have reasonable agreement among our, our evaluators. And uh, we register a protocol at the Open Science Framework. And I don't know if David Mellows is, he, is here, but uh, we took the pre-registration challenge. Uh, so it's all uh, frozen there. Uh, we did a sample size calculation to reach 90% power to detect a 10% difference. That's 76 articles per group, each one triple scored by three people. Uh, and this is actually my 
main result here. So this is a world premiere of the primary outcome. Uh, this is over the overall percentage of reported items. So of, of all applicable items in the questionnaire, how many did the article report? And actually, we have a very small difference uh, in favor of PubMed. So it's like 59% versus 64%. So the peer-reviewed articles do slightly better. There are some caveats which I'll mention later. But this is uh, significant, although it explains a very small part of the variation. So like if you look at the ranges on both sides, they're actually pretty much in the same ballpark. This seems to happen uh, for all types of articles. It doesn't seem to be because of any specific subtypes. So both in vitro vertebrate and human, uh, all of them have the same uh, small difference uh, in favor uh, of PubMed articles. Uh, we have some secondary outcomes. This is the correlation of quality pro of, of reporting with the impact factor for PubMed articles. It's actually a negative one. So the higher your impact factor, the worse your quality reporting. I mean, it doesn't mean that the papers are worse. Maybe they're just longer or more complicated. But I mean, it's not the first time I've seen this. So it doesn't appear that uh, high-end journals have any better quality of reporting than the, than, than the lower-end ones. It's a small correlation, but it's, it's also borderline, borderline significant. Uh, another secondary outcome is region. So we worry that maybe some regions use more preprints, and that's actually the case. So we have a lot more preprints from North America and Europe uh, compared to Asia, Latin America, and Africa, where it got none. Uh, interestingly, the differences between peer-reviewed articles and preprints seem to be larger uh, in Asia and Latin America, but the sample sizes are small, so I can't tell you much uh, that this is actually real. But uh, well, uh, if you look at North America, for example, uh, it's an exact tie. Uh, Another secondary outcome, and this is kind of interesting, so this, after all the very objective questions, is this there yes or no, yes or no, yes or no, we had two subjective questions where uh, evaluators were asked to uh, rank from one to five how clear was the title and abstract of the paper, and was the required information easy to find and extract? So is it easy to find uh, the res I mean, the the answers to the questions we were asking. And actually, this is the larger difference. So like in, in, in this sense, PubMed does considerably better. And that may have to do with the papers being simpler. That may have to do with just formatting, actually, just like people are used to reading a PDF with type sub columns or something. Uh, preprints usually don't have that. Uh, this actually has some influence uh, in quality of reporting. So there is a correlation between information being easy to find, subjectively speaking, uh, and the, 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 the actual reporting score. And we actually went on to an exporter analysis. I mean, Maybe this is just formatting. Let's just do a simple thing and divide the bioarchive sample in, into those that have figures embedded within the text versus those that have figures dumped in the end, like most manuscripts that you submit, actually. And if you look at that, uh, there's actually a small difference. Of course, this is not significant because the sample size is small. But the, 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 the articles with figures embedded actually do exactly the same as the PubMed ones. Uh, so maybe like a simple thing we can do to improve preprints is just uh, embedding the figures in the text and taking a little bit of care in terms of uh, formatting. There's a lot of caveats. Uh, first of all, articles vary very much between scientific disciplines. And our questionnaire may be more applicable to some than others. Uh, in, interestingly, uh, a minority of articles actually fit our inclusion criteria. thought we're being very vague here, or taking anything with a comparison. But actually, only one fourth of articles, more or less, uh, do have uh, original results, statistical comparison between groups. Uh, our, our evaluators are mostly from uh, bench science, regular lab science, biochemistry molecular biology, uh, cell biology, they could have more difficulty with some fields. I mean, when we designed the questionnaires, we were thinking about the simple data, like two or three bars, and then one statistical test. And then you get into this big genomics papers, and it's like this huge big data stuff that is, sometimes it's hard to extract information and make sense of the questionnaire. And really, I think this is an, the most important caveat, is that uh, the preprints in biology have been uptaken by uh, uh, some communities. So BioArchive is mostly bioinformatics, genomics, and neuroscience. I don't have the count here because we're finishing counting. But this is right, something like 80 something percent of what you find. Whereas PubMed is much more about clinical articles. There's more classic in vitro experiments as well. Uh, so I mean, if commu different communities have different reporting standards, or if the questionnaire applies better to some types of articles than others, the difference could be all this and have nothing to do with peer review, actually. Uh, another thing, we just analyzed a single figure, which was the first figure table for the paper. This is a shame for clinical uh, articles, because usually table one is just like based on characteristics. It's not the actual data from the article. But uh, well, that, that, that's another limitation. That said, I mean, even with all that, 
I think our general conclusion is that, is that preprints are not a bunch of crap. Uh, quality of reporting is generally very comparable between preprints and peer-reviewed articles. There's a, a slight advantage to the latter, but really uh, the, the, it's, it's in the same ballpark. And I think that's one important finding to, to, to give to the, to the community. Uh, this could be peer-reviewed, but it, it could also be clarity of presentation or just simple uh, formatting and typesetting. Uh, it could be very well the research field distribution. Uh, and of course, it could be actual peer review. We can't pre uh, say much about that. Uh, but I think the second round, actually comparing preprints with the published versions, should give us more direct evidence of the direct effects of peer review. Uh, we should be starting that very soon. If you want to work as an evaluator, or you know someone who does, who is in life sciences and would like to grade those papers, get in touch. We'll probably need a few more people, because some are leaving now. Uh, and uh, this is it. But for the moment, I think this brings out something important, which is that reporting quality in the average preprint in life sciences is largely comparable to that of published articles. Slightly lower on average, but not that much that we should actually consider it like a different thing. Uh, well, it is a different thing, but like not, we shouldn't disconsider it. It's probably a valid scholarly uh, contribution. And actually, given what preprints provide in terms of agility, accessibility, we should probably support them as a valid form of uh, contribution within life sciences. And actually, you should keep in mind that preprints have the large philosophical advantage of taking away many of the nasty incentives that are carried by the pre-publication peer, peer review system. Uh, I mean, much has been written about this, but really concentrating your quality control on the published article, which is kind of a story, uh, tends to... I mean, tends to give the incentive to people to cut corners and like make this the most beautiful, the most impactful, the most novel story, which usually means shuffling, I mean, shoving a lot of stuff uh, out of the paper, which makes it uh, like other synthesis of reality. They're not lies, but not exactly true. So like your social network profile has like three pictures. They're yours. But it's usually the best three pictures you took in like 3,000 that year. So I, I think peer review has that effect. And uh, I, 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 of course, I don't have data for this. But I'm a firm, belie I'm a firm believer that preprints can actually, like removing the pre-publication barrier can actually have positive effects uh, on reproducibility that can actually offset anything you can see in terms of quality reporting. But of course, this is an opinion uh, not, that doesn't come from the data. So uh, acknowledgments, uh, Clarissa Carneiro did uh, the coordination of all the 15 people who worked as evaluators. It was a lot of, of work, but it was fun. I mean, it's, it's nice to get big groups involved uh, in, in, in big projects. We'd like to, uh, to thank uh, ASAP Bio for advertising the project. Our funders, uh, I'd like to thank SciHub, and this is an endorsement, uh, <laughs> actually, because for us doing meta research, especially in the developing world, is like very hard to, to do without it. And uh, I, I think it's, I mean, if you're look, trying to get a, like a representative sample of PubMed, there's really no other way for us, uh, if not using SciHub, uh, not doing it would essentially be doing bad science. So uh, I, I, have, I have a very hard time uh, ethically justifying doing bad science or bad medicine because of uh, respect to, I don't know, copyright. Uh, that's it. I'd like to thank the Brazilian democracy, which is under attack. And if you know people who vote there, uh, please uh, let them, I mean, convince them to make sense, because otherwise we won't have science to present in a while. So uh, we're worried. But thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. You talked about some of the formatting differences between the preprint and the published being as one possible uh, explanatory variable uh, in the difference. For the second phase of your research, have you considered trying to strip out those differences by just having uh, people compare plain text with figures? <laughs> Yeah, we considered this for the first stage, actually. Yeah. Uh, but like uh, one thing, it, well, it's a lot of work. Right. Uh, and two things, I think from, I mean, if typesetting is important, that, that is actually a, a contribution of the, of the publication process. So I think that's, it, it's fair to keep it. I mean, uh, right. you're doing it. Uh, I think it's an interesting question. I think it helps with blinding. I mean, we couldn't blind things yeah. because, uh, uh, because, I mean, it's, it's easy to tell one from the other. Uh, but again, I think this is one thing that happens in the editorial process. I, I, I wouldn't want to take it out. I think it's, I think it's part of it. But I think, I mean, uh, that is very exploratory. It's like a few articles. I won't 
really like make, I'm not sure of that difference. But if that makes and really makes a difference, that's actually a very very simple measure that I mean you can advertise to people and like if you just make it a little bit. Reviewers usually complain that like, it's it's just I mean it's better to have figures in the middle of the text. I mean it's I mean. Yeah. Everybody thinks that, but so like maybe maybe we found one of the simple things. But I, I, it's like ten or fifteen articles. I wouldn't really put my hand on the fire for that. Um, I was curious whether um, or a, another subgroup analysis you could do would be to look at uh, editorial. Um, you know, the sort of editorial style of the journal. So, for example, whether it's a community editor, uh, academic editor, professional editor, or, um, you know, society journals versus, uh, you know, different kinds of, um, yeah, types of journal and whether that has any effect on the... Yeah, the we have not done that, but it's actually pretty interesting. I mean, I, I, I think we could probably... I mean, one thing we're trying to do first is, like, just look at research area, but it's kind of, like, hard to classify sometimes. But that's actually a good proposal. I think the, 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 the types of journals can be pretty much objectively defined, and I think it's, yeah, thanks for the suggestion. We'll, we'll take that. Thanks so much for um, showing these results. I think it's super important for anyone who uh, loves preprints, uh, because that's the argument that comes up most often. Oh, it's just bullshit. Um, I was wondering, because you got so many manual labor and people involved in in scoring or in assessing these preprints and uh, PubMed entries. Do you think, either in the short or long term, some of this is automatable? So reading out information in an automated way? I'd, I, I'd, love, it if it <laughs> I'd love it if it was, but uh, I think at the moment it's still hard. I mean, we, it's definitely a field for development. I think uh, our friends and camarades who did the first study are, are, are big in trying to like do simple things in machine learning. I think the question is a little bit big to, to, to like, we're, we're not going to get like everything is, which is in there, but maybe like three or four or five of the questions might be easy to, to, to pick up by, by, by machines, and maybe I mean, you can use those as a proxy for the rest. I think it's a very interesting area of study. Uh, I mean, we have our database. If you want to try, try out your machine learning things on seeing whether somebody reports whether this is standard deviation, standard error, go for it. It's, I think it will help very much. OK, we have one question here and then one question there, and I think we're going to have to cut it off. Hello. Um, thanks. Great presentation. I was wondering whether you whether you knew what you knew about your preprint group of preprints there, and whether they any of them had been uh, published before they were preprinted, and whether all of them had been preprinted before they were published. That kind of thing. Do you uh, get Do you get me? Well, yeah. By definition, a preprint has to be out there before it's published. Uh, BioArchive strictly has a policy of not taking in published articles. I've tried to submit a revised version of something that was published, and they said, no, you can, you can put it here. So I'm pretty sure all of them were there before they're published. Uh, they have a lot of versions sometimes. We have like first, second, third, fourth. We, we took care to always take the first version. Uh, I I'll very much doubt that something had been published before. We did not check, but I think BioArchive checks. So I mean, if their check works, it's probably valid. Just to be devil's advocate here, I mean, one could also argue that what you don't capture in your research are those papers which are so flawed or so bad that they never get actually published, right? Because you only compare preprints against their published counterparts, but an important role of peer review and editorial uh, review is the selection and um, to sort out the, the really poor Paper. So I don't. I don't think the conclusion is valid to say, okay, we can, you know, preprints are generally comparable with what's published because in your research you don't actually look at those, which never make it to the published stage. Yeah. Well, Would you agree? I, I, I agree, but I mean that, that's actually one valid function of peer review. So if it actually improves manuscripts in that sense, that's valid as well. I think that's a, that's a good point. I mean, uh, I mean it could be peer review actually improving something that passes. It could be peer review improving on average because like the junk gets filtered. Uh, but still, prints are never going to be published. Do we have any data uh, on that? I think the archive number is something around the 80% of things actually get published. In our sample, we, we, we're, we're actually starting this up again, but we looked, I think, at the end of, or, or at the beginning of this year, uh, I think 60-something percent of them 
uh, in a year and so like in a little less than a year had been published. I think the number now should be around maybe 70, 70 something, but we will we'll check again. But most of them do get published. Okay, uh, I think we need to wind it up. Thank you very much. Good conversation.